well, as people start coming into the waiting room and, and ask pounding at the door to uh, to come into the talk, um, welcome to you all. And you. Um, <laughs> uh, I will probably, well, I won't bother meeting you, but, you know, if your dog box or something, well, we should all know. I've had to shut mine outside, actually. She got very excited about the whole process just now. <laughs> waiting room a bit. Okay, so people are flooding in now. Oh gosh, we've got Scotland here, we've got Limington, Ellsford. <laughs> it's amazing how um, Zoom brings people together, doesn't it? Okay. Um, well, we were going to have some lovely videos today, but uh, Zoom has decided not to allow me to, to actually run them. I might have a little go and go onto YouTube and see if I can do them directly, but uh, otherwise we'll just use the, uh, the photographs that I've got on this uh, presentation and also the lovely photographs that Godfrey has uh, very kindly donated. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know, Godfrey is uh, a mine of historical information who lives in Olsford and he's got this amazing collection of old photographs of Olsford. So that's particularly useful for us today. Okay, so I'm still madly trying, trying to let people in the room here. <laughs> So um, while we're um, waiting for the uh, people to come in, then I will just uh, change the first slide. Let me do that. There we go. Um, and uh, I wonder if uh, Godfrey will know about this because it's his photograph, but some of you may be interested or, or, or uh, amused by the, uh, the fact that in the olden days of farming watercress that the uh, i hope i'm right on this i'm sure godfrey will correct me um that the workers were given a, a fingernail check to make sure that they weren't um actually adding any substances to the the, the watercress production other than the the rivers were bringing or that were in the watercress beds i thought it was particularly apt for today with with the, the present pandemic Okay, so I think we'll get started now because we're five minutes in. Um, okay, so uh, I will ask uh, Julie, who's helping on the behalf of the Watercrest Festival, if she sees anybody else in the waiting room and I don't spot it, then um, perhaps she can uh, use the chat box or wave to me or do something anyway. Cool. So um, let's get started then. Uh, for the uh, benefit of those who've just come into the presentation. It's uh, very kind that uh, the Watercrest Festival team have allowed my charity, to which I'm trustee, called the Watercrest Way, to actually do this talk for you. And it will be run similarly to the ones that we actually do live, where we take groups of people around Olsford looking at various aspects to do with the town, uh, obviously with a, a Watercrest flavour, particularly in, in this uh, particular uh, venue today. Right, so um, just for a little bit of background, I've just put the Watercrest Way trail up for you, um, which has basically um, three distinct sections. It's an unusual trail and it uh, links up two of the old railway lines, the Watercrest line that we'll be talking about a lot today, and also the uh, Didcot, Newbury, Southampton um, line, which uh, went from uh, on the, the western side of the trail, uh, that's like uh, number two on the uh, map there, and then we've linked the two old railway lines with uh, historic droves and other roads and footpaths, bridleways, to make a circular trail. So it is a unique type of trail, and uh, we've been going really since 2015, but we were incorporated as a charity in 2016. And the whole trail is way marked for walkers. So we'll today see some uh, of the uh, the trail around Oldsford. And you don't have to do the whole trail. There are multiple gateways and shorter sections that, that you can do. So I think uh, you know, there are very few people that actually do the whole marathon trail in one go. Although we do have ultra marathon walkers now who do it and runners who do it twice in a day which uh, i think uh, 
it's challenging, but anyway, it can be done. It's about 27 miles. It, it fluctuates, which sounds a bit strange, which is why we're not quite on the Ordnance Survey maps yet, because um, we keep getting access or increased access to the old railway lines, and that's our whole remit. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, so let's get to moving on. It's now jammed. Let's go again. So we've just uh, decided to improve our branding. So you'll see a distinctive yellow and uh, green uh, brand colours in all our documents from now on. And we're improving our website and our social media presence. And just a little bit of background here are the trustees. We started with eight and we've had a few changes over time. But um, I'm Kim, who is the one in the middle there. You've probably seen me at the bottom of the screen with a, a much nicer background than my lounge. I must admit, having a bit of watercress sticking out of my ear. And um, the trustees are always keen to recruit new ones and also volunteers as well. We don't just have trustees. We have a little band of merry um, volunteers who help us do our various uh, activities. And nowadays, we've all got quite adept at using Zoom. Okay, distinct problems getting this PowerPoint to um, work. So here we go. People often get the watercrest line and the watercrest way confused. So I just made these two simple images here. Uh, the watercrest line is a separate charity and it was established after the, the original watercrest line was ripped out after beaching cuts and volunteers then gradually opened up the 10 mile section east from Ulsford and nowadays the uh, heritage trains are a common feature and have now hit the headlines nationally because of government grants during the, uh, the Covid times. But the Watercrest Way is for the parts of the Watercrest line that were never reopened and as I say it's a, a, an unusual trail because it's a very it's a long it isn't quite long distance I think you have to be 28 miles to be long distance but we're, we're almost there at 27 miles and um, it, it was actually named because watercrest is a feature of the whole of the trail not just around Ulsford so wherever you go around the trail um, you'll see either working or uh, abandoned watercrest farms and um, it includes as it says there the lost seven miles from Alsford through to Wards Winchester, gets as far as Kingsworthy, and um, then the, the Didcot Newbury railway line. And uh, we are actually mutually supportive. So um, we've got, I've just picked up this image here, which was two, no, actually three years ago in the pouring rain where we were setting up for a live watercrest festival. And the volunteers for the watercrest line helped the watercrest way put their um, little. Uh, gazebo up to uh, talk to the visitors because every year the festival attracts uh, well I'm not quite sure of the numbers actually thousands. So um, let's start off with having a look at uh, the watercrest and if you look at the, uh, the Ordnance Survey map here and we have actually got a license for this now from the uh, Ordnance Survey so thanks to them and um, you can actually probably spot a couple of signs that actually say watercrest beds but I've just ringed the actual watercress farms which are around Ulsford and you'll see some of them in dots that means that they are abandoned um, the one on the extreme east uh, where uh, I've got my cursor at the moment is uh, the most recent one and the tour we're going to do today is outlined in red and it uh, is about two two and a half miles um, it, it would take you know just about an hour and a half if you walked around it very quickly if that but of course normally guided tours take a bit long, longer than that because uh, of the interesting points that one can see on the way around so that's what I want to point out with you, to you today and um, we'll have a look at particularly the watercrest with the link to the watercrest line but there will be some other snippets of history thrown in as well not everything because Alsford is an amazing place for um, uh, history and heritage and being obvious in your face it's very easy to spot things as you go around 
Okay, so if we just go on. We obviously wish we were there. These are images of previous watercrest festivals thronged with people. And then I've just put in a few images of our guided walks. Some of them have got uh, specific hazards, which are rather nice hazards, actually. I'm actually gui guiding a tour this Saturday on the risk assessment, apart from three pages on COVID, had half a page on swans. So, you know, it, you have to plan these things. Um, and here we've got a picture of the watercrest beds that we actually frequent quite a lot. And uh, it's a, a, a very pleasant uh, thing to be able to do, to actually do this virtual tour instead. So I decided to split the, uh, the tour up into 10 stages. So we'll plod through them. Um, hopefully it won't be a plod and you, you can always turn off, can't you? Or just pretend you're there. And um, we will start at the railway station, which you can see in the extreme south of the uh, map there. And I will um, hopefully, if this works, fly you around it but the fact i'm not going to do that unfortunately for some reason this powerpoint today is not letting me use live videos and live links but if you have the ordnance survey app then um you can actually fly around like a in a sort of a stealth bomber or something uh your whichever route you want to take which is a rather pleasant thing to be able to do so i'm afraid the uh, next best thing i can do is just to show you a a uh, um, an image of from the satellite okay so there we've got a nice little image of of Ulsford very small market town the railway line is in the extreme south of the picture you can see a very linear feature here and the um the the tour takes us from the station um northwards to the uh, uh, some of the older areas of Ulsford and what is actually called Old Alsford, and then around this large watercress farm here, and then there's a loop back to the railway station. Right, so we'll start off at uh, what I've called Pride and Prejudice, because actually the guy who really kick-started the whole of the watercress history off by creating the watercress line was um, the nephew of Jane Austen, um, Edward Knight, rather distinguished gentleman there with his hand well, um, moustache and he chaired the investors back in the early 1800s um, or so mid 1800s rather so by 1861 the railway company was formed called the Alton Alsford and Winchester Railway Company quite a mouthful so it's actually shortened and changed to the Mid Hants Railway when it actually opened in 1865 and it was all part of this railway mania where there were all these competing railway companies trying to get a look in on the, um, the the growing prosperity during Victorian times. So 17 miles were opened up from Ulsford east to Alton and then there's the mainline train um, from another company which then goes to London and it was uh, nicknamed the Watercrest Line a little bit later on in the 1800s um, but it could just as easily have been Turnip or Racehorse Line I guess because quite a large number of uh, turnips anyway were, were carried on the on the line but watercress um, certainly has uh, become its uh, favoured nickname and then the heritage railway line which was um, started almost immediately after the line was ripped out in after 1973 adopted that as well and I learned uh, this week that actually the mid Hans is being dropped out of the name altogether in terms of branding it's just going to be called the watercress line from now on Okay, so we start the tour just um, opposite the railway station at this building here. So it's taken uh, just two weeks ago. And it's actually um, originally a, uh, a grain uh, storage area feed or feed mill, which was um, built in 1860. And the, um, the sidings which linked the uh, main railway track to this um, busy goods yard just outside the station are still there though most people don't even notice them I don't think and uh, thanks to Godfrey for this fantastic picture of um, the local farmers actually unloading watercress onto one of the um, the old uh, carriages um, which uh, would get to go on the railway line the um, 
the actual uh, watercress were carried on these things called flats. And apparently the people who worked in the watercress were called cressors, although I have struggled to find many more mentions about that, but it's in some um, of the documents. Uh, just um, going to let somebody else in who's come in late. Uh, right, so apologies for the uh, person who's just come in late. You probably don't know what's going on now, but just follow through, you'll, you'll, you'll get the idea. Um, so the watercress actually was brought in from quite a long, large area around Ulsford, and um, apparently these uh, particular farmers here can actually be traced back to the farms where they um, originated from. Um, in, uh, they're all in a radius of, uh, well, they're pretty well all within five miles, I would say, definitely. Um, but uh, the watercress, the train system was absolutely critical for watercress farming. And we'll discover a bit more about that in a minute. You've actually got to go uh, a little bit further afield to start our story, actually, because um, up in up in Kent, and you can see the um, pinpointed there on the map, which takes you to this area here, and it stems back to um, a guy called William Bradbury, who actually started watercress farming um, f on a commercial scale in um, just outside London to feed Covent Garden, which is where Ulsford's watercress also largely ends up into. And this is the only picture I could find easily of um, the watercress farming in London. This is actually his grandson. Um, and the there is still a nursery there um, in Kent, which uh, uh, relates back to the original watercress farm. Um, they were actually using river water to grow the watercress in. And uh, there's a fascinating history to be, to be looked into there, I think. But uh, we have to go back even further than that, don't we, to see how watercress has been so important in diets. Um, we're talking about centuries of people knowing that it had medicinal or um, important nutrition status. And the um, image there of Hippocrates, um, he actually founded his hospital apparently near a stream where watercress was grown for um, particularly cures of um, uh, stomach and, and liver problems. The Romans actually cr created the name um, and uh, there's actually a gin made just outside uh, of Alsford now called Twisted Nose which is quite uh, a good idea. Napoleon apparently was a fan and it actually became what's called a national institution during the, the, uh, the two main wars because the government promoted it as a cheap a nutritious uh, type of food for um, people and uh, it was actually served as, as part of school dinners at that time. But by the 1940s um, it, it started to dwindle uh, after the 1940s so that um, by the start of the 20th century really, uh, sorry the end of the 20th century, there were very few watercress farms um, and acreage across the whole of Britain. And it wasn't really until about 2003 that uh, there was a huge rebranding campaign by the uh, a sort of a group of watercress farms, which um, uh, had a, an attractive little uh, uh, slogan there. And then, of course, a little bit closer to us, we have Ramsey, etc., uh, and many, many other celebrities who've actually um, used watercress as part of their. Um, activities and uh, rebranded it as a, another a superfood of the 21st century. And in fact, um, the Watercress Company, which is one of the biggest watercress producers now in Britain, were giving, giving out free watercress um, to the um, NHS, particularly during last year. Right, so if we go now from the station and the sort of start of the watercress and walk down into the main part of Alsford, you walk down the station road and um, so every time that we shift location I'll show you one of these maps so that you get some idea of where you're going. It's supposed to be a virtual tour. Um, I did think about trying to do a video of the whole thing but um, that was uh, beyond my technical abilities but you know perhaps in the future that might be done. Um, so Station Road then that's got a history all of its own. Let's see if we can have a look at it and uh, we've got a nice aerial view here of 
um, the whole of Alsford. This is actually looking um, towards the church. This is actually looking um, south, really. You can just about see the railway line um, in the mid to far distance. I've labeled where the railway station is. Station Road is the um, first red oblong that you can see on the map. And uh, the image you've got there of the photograph is actually looking down Station Road towards the railway station. But it, it wasn't a, a road originally. It was um, actually one of these things, these things called a burgage plot. And we're going to have a look at that particular aspect of Alsford's history. That image is actually taken during one of the Watercrest festivals in the past with people thronging the what's known as the Broad Street. And we'll be walking down that on our virtual tour in just a minute. So Alsford is uh, an unusual little town because um, it actually retains a large proportion of its town planning system from the 11th and 12th century, which is on the cusp of the, the two centuries there, where two different bishops created what was called New Alsford then. So it's still called New Alsford, although it's, it's actually um, rather ancient. And um, the, the actual layout of the, of the town was um, on a long linear plot um, some information there about um, how many rods and perches um, it was. So in, in Ellsford there was a, a 33 by 330 foot plot and it's a very clever way of maximising the frontage of buildings whilst giving privacy. You can see that in many um, towns, I, you've noticed it, you know, when you go to places like, oh, just Marrakesh for example, you can see it and um, you can see it in um, many other cities in Britain, although um, most places in Britain have lost their burgage plots because of um, infilling or densification of the town centres over time. It was a clever lay layout because um, in the long plot there were outhouses for animals and servants and um, uh, uh, some small market gardens. And as we walk down and have a look at um, the Broad Street in just a minute, um, there are glimpses of these burgage plots behind the, um, the houses there. Right, so um, we're going down now into Broad Street itself, which uh, is just a little bit further um, north from the, the railway station. And we'll start off with Painted Ladies. We just have some video clips, but unfortunately we can't see those. Um, so again, thanks Godfrey for this uh, nice picture. This is just on the, um, the junction of Broad Street and um, the uh, uh, West and East Street, which had different names in the past called um, Sheep Coat or Sheep Cot Road and Ram Alley. East and West Street sound very boring compared to those two, don't they? But Alsford was based on um, sheep uh, uh, and the marketing of them. And um, here we've got an image again, at the, um, I think this is just at the start of the um, 1900s of Alsford with the Broad Street there. But trees haven't been a feature of the, the high street always. They're, they're uh, sort of more of a a, a recent feature, um, but uh, the, the current image of Alsford Broad Street is somewhat, somewhat different. It's uh, quite difficult to actually find an image without cars in it now, although that might change in the future, I think, because there's increased pedestrianisation threatened for, to, to Alsford, which will bring it back to perhaps um, a little bit more of its original um, uh, looks. And um, I've chosen some pictures to um, illustrate the beautiful what we call painted ladies of the Broad Street and they are uh, fantastic Georgian buildings but mainly on these Norman routes the, the original Burgage plot routes um, there aren't any Norman houses left obviously because of fire after fire after fire and it wasn't until Georgian times when tiled routes came into play that um, fires started to reduce in their importance in, in Ulsford. And as you walk down um, Broad Street, you go past lots of different um, in interesting buildings and links to other aspects of the past. So for example, uh, a famous bookshop here has actually got a, uh, a spy link to um, one of the places in Station Road, the actual public conveniences. I always get strange looks when I go in the, well, I don't actually go in the gentleman's toilets to investigate where the dead uh, letter drop was. I always send somebody else in for me. But um, it, there is a plaque on the toilets actually explaining the link between um, the, uh, the the spies who, who took some of the secrets of the dreadnought submarine back in the 1960s and were caught eventually. 
but Ulsford's got a, a, an interesting uh, link with this uh, spy chain. But there are all sorts of other aspects of Ulsford too. You go past a 19th century poet's house, you go past a very bright blue house, which you can just see in the bottom photograph there, which is the old post office. Um, there have been several locations for post offices in Ulsford, and um, this one in particular, you can just imagine the, um, the sort of um, the, the horns blowing as the uh, heralding the arrival of the post chase with the um, the letters in back in the 1800s. It seemed quite exciting. And um, as you walk down Broad Street, there are other lovely houses. There's a, a blacksmith there, um, one of many of the past, and there's a house where the headquarters of the USA um, um, the troops were stationed during the second the uh, Second World War. Hambo. Um, is a, a dog who is buried uh, in uh, another part of Ulsford, which uh, is, a, is a, a lovely walk on all by itself. And we'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute. And uh, we actually find this house called Pineapple House. And unfortunately, I didn't quite get on the photograph the beautiful pineapple shapes that you've got on top of the house, um, which were uh, traditional to show the wealth of a house during the early part of the 18th century, well named. So going down Broad Street, um, you, it merges into Mill Lane. I've called it a mini Marrakesh because it was actually incredibly famous for its tanneries. And um, I'll just put all the, the images on here so you can see them all. So um, as you go down Mill Lane, well named because there, there, were, there were indeed many mills there, you actually go past um, uh, uh, one of the, the burgish plots there, you can just see the, the, the garden behind the lich gate and uh, the house there has disappeared. But either side are two of the oldest houses in Ulsford. And um, there's actually a very small um, <clears throat> fire mark just up on the left hand building um, there, which uh, was a, a common way of uh, making sure that fire engines pulled by horses in those days actually got to put your fire out. Otherwise, uh, Apparently they let your house burn. Anyway, um, as you go down, there are uh, some lovely interpretation boards around Ulsford. Uh, we were following partly this thing called the Millennium Trail. And um, there's an image there on the Millennium Trail placard of what a tannery worker might have been um, doing. And uh, the smell and noise must have been absolutely astonishing in this uh, location from about Henry VIII's time through to about 160 years ago when the last mill shut. And um, as you walk down the, this area, you go past a, a fantastic cascade of water, which is the outfall for, from um, one of the uh, other things that the um, Bishop de Lucy made back in Norman times, which is a, a large, a very, very large fish pond called the Great Pond. A bit of debate about that. It does. It, does, it did not help the navigation canal that goes down into Winchester. I think it was designed mainly for um, keeping stocks for the, uh, the Bishop Rick, not just in Ulsford, where there was a, a big palace, but in Winchester itself. And um, the original building here had the water going through it to power the, uh, the mill, but um, nowadays it goes outside. It's a very attractive feature. So as you walk down here, then you get to what's called the weir or laundry. Um, and we're going into an area of abandoned watercress beds now. So um, this is a slight blurred, I'm sorry about that, um, picture of the current watercress beds. Um, and this is what it looked like in um, just 1960. And you can see here a sort of terraced effect um, in, in the top picture. It looks like there, there are wooden supports actually to keep the terracing in place. Um, but um, quite from an early age, watercress on a commercial scale was grown in uh, gravel based beds, and uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later in the talk. But uh, this is um, basically abandoned now and um, has become uh, almost rewilded. So the timeline you've got on the screen um, you know, basically, this is the River Arl, which is a tributary of the Itchen, um, had a series of fen meadows, then the during Norman times, it was ponded up and then um, watercress beds were created. I think these ones actually only date back to about 1950. Some of the other watercress beds around Ulsford obviously date back to the late 1800s. And uh, locals actually, until quite recently, used this honesty box 
um, which was placed just outside one of the buildings, just out of view on, on these two main photographs. And the current owner who I got in touch with recently um, was, he is a biologist and he was telling me that um, he's not exactly rewilding it, he's just letting a non, he's, he's adopting a non-intervention position, he said, um, because he wants to encourage diverse fen meadows there and um, change it from the original monoculture. And his recordings so far are listed there of uh, the wildlife returning since um, the late 1990s to this little location, which is literally on the edge of the built up area of Arlesford. So as we walk um, further around the uh, back of Arlesford, um, we get to a commercial uh, set of watercress beds and um, this is a, a good uh, view of them taken a few weeks ago. The, um, there is a, uh, the Watercrest Festival is keen to reenact things. So you can see the picture there of the horse and the flatbed um, with uh, people dressed up, looking suspiciously wearing as if they've got micro jumpers on. But, you know, it, it's a good token towards um, the Victorian. Well, they've got the flat caps anyway. Um, so uh, it, it's quite a nice idea. And Watercrest would have been taken from here up to the railway station. Um, along the, uh, the, the River Arl. We'll look at that in just a minute too. So Hampshire is the uh, UK's centre still, or capital of watercress production. And um, uh, the title of saying poor man's bread no longer is simply um, a little uh, bit of history that uh, when the watercress originally was taken by train to London, it was sold in paper cones um, often by the same people that sold flowers. The children of Victorian times were very um, involved in all this uh, production and selling. And uh, the, uh, it was called poor man's bread because it gave nutritious um, addition to diet in a, in a time of, well, rickets in particular, with particularly a, a terrible scourge in London. And uh, the watercress beds are now very highly mechanised um, on the whole. There are just two what might be called organic watercress beds around Ellsford, but this is not one of them. And uh, the concrete lining gravel beds, uh, they've literally been refreshing all those over the last week. Uh, when you drive around or walk around this area, the sound of tractors and um, uh, the sort of heavy equipment, which is scraped out the old plants and put in new ones. And um, watercress is grown in two ways, both by seeds and by propagation. And uh, to help it uh, escape the worst frost, so that we don't tend to get so many as we used to in the area, um, you can just see in the picture some plastic coverings and um, they're common uh, to, to, to try and force the, the or, or to encourage the watercress to grow um, through, uh, to extend the season. And I've just got this word rokes down the bottom because um, rokes are a particular microclimate that you get um, not necessarily because it's watercress, but simply because you've got this water, um, a large spread out surface, which encourages fog or mist anyway, to um, develop at certain times of the uh, year, and they're called rokes. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, tempt fate here by actually playing the video, which is a shame really, because um, the video that was done in 2015 by the Watercress Company um, is particularly good, and I can recommend you actually um, Look at that. Um, I can give you the reference at the end. It's uh, it's just a five minute clip, which actually does the whole of watercress farming in, in one sort of chunk. It's rather good. Um, some people say, well, can you not just grow it in rivers and, and so on? Well, um, the problem with that is you can't control the inputs and outputs. And certainly in today's production of watercress, where it's got a fairly high chemical input, that's not um, feasible in terms of the um, control of any effluent. It's also not very good about controlling the problem of liver fluke because um, watercress naturally is um, subject to uh, the sort of the, the, the cycle of snails which produce liver fluke and in fact a lot of the cattle down all the way down the Itchen Valley um, in the conserved areas, the triple SIs where cattle are used, they have high doses of liver fluke at the moment which have to be sorted out through uh, anti uh, sort of um, wormers. So it's not advisable really to uh, eat wild watercress just in case of that particular problem. So the concrete beds and the gravel 
they are um, make it much easier to control um, pests of all sorts and also to um, control the water. It's very, very high intensive use of water. Right, and uh, the cone there, I've just uh, put on there because the the watercress was all, all, always sold in little cones and nowadays it's actually marketed in the slightly grease proof type uh, watercress uh, paper, which I find quite amusing actually to think that's still going on. Right, so if you walk around the watercress beds, um, which that farm that we were looking at was called Pingleston Farm, takes you to this thing called the Eel House. And this is an unusual aspect of Alsford, but again, linked to its uh, water heritage. And it all begins on moonless dark nights. And this um, image, I just picked off Facebook actually recently, um, just popped up. Uh, it's actually taken in Winchester, but this eel um, could well have uh, either, well, come from Alsford and be picked up there because these eels are all part of a, an amazing um, cycle of uh, wildlife, which people back in Victorian times started using. So this is a very rare building in Britain left called the Eel House. And some of you may well have seen there or visited it. And um, it uh, was built in 1820. And it captures the eels as they um, swim downstream to return to their spawning ground to breed. So they actually breed in just off uh, the Bahamas in a sort of area called the Sargasso Sea, famous for its um, seaweed and plant growth. And then from there, they return all the way back up to um, where they grow up, uh, which is quite a long journey. And on the way, they have to uh, obviously change from being saltwater beasts to freshwater uh, and then back again. It's quite an amazing um, uh, ecological adaptation. And originally, uh, the eels were caught by the water gushing through the three um, little uh, arches that you can see there and uh, nets were put to catch them and they only actually uh, travel on these dark moonless nights so it's a bit poetic isn't it and then originally before uh, refrigeration was invented they were actually kept alive for uh, a time in wet sacks um, and uh, taken by horse to, to Winchester and later trains and vans and in fact the watercrest line used to have um, tanks full of eels going off to Billing Billingsgate for quite a long time uh, they're not caught anymore they, they still they're, they're still in the river but in very low numbers so from the eel house if you follow the river Earl back up a little bit more towards Pinkleston farm um, we actually go along this thing called a river road. So let's have a look at that. So here is one, perhaps one of the most photographed buildings in, in Ellsford, the Fulling Mill. This is not um, a different sort of mill though from the mills at um, that we saw at the bottom of Mill Lane. This one was used for um, pounding fuller's earth into cotton to close up the weave. So it's called a fulling mill and um, the water power was harnessed for that. So this particular one is very, very old. And there's a lovely old photograph there of it. But you can also see on that photograph, I'll just move that across, um, that uh, there is a, a horse and cart with actually, I think, watercress being uh, transported on, on a flatbed. He's, he or she, presumably it's a he, um, is uh, actually driving that horse up what's called Pingleston Road. Um, it, it was designated a road until quite recently, but um, is now the bed of the River Isle. And he's come out of the Ford just in front of the Fulling Mill to go up to the railway station. A fantastic uh, place to go and visit. And uh, the um, it's now a very, very famous uh, tourist spot. And we can't stop this uh, or finish this talk without talking a little bit about Amy very quickly. Um, she's one of the local celebrities and her and her father uh, are instrumental in, in changing the feeding habits of the the ducks, swans, coots and I'm afraid fish now because the fish, uh, the grayling and the trout are, are getting in on the act as well but they um, provide proper uh, food for wildfowl which um, doesn't affect their wing growth and, and 
affect their growth generally. So people then give a donation and little tables being set up there and it's become quite a local celebrity spot, which uh, is a fantastic place to see the wildlife. Right, so um, backtracking a little bit, we come from the, um, the eel house and the fulling mill um, heading back towards the railway station to this road called the Dean. And I've called it the long haul because it is gently sloping uphill and then there is quite a, a steep incline back up to the railway station. And this is actually um, one of the many pubs, apparently 24 or even 25 pubs I was told the other day, that uh, were in operation in Oldsford just at the end of the um, 1800s. And it's called the Dean. And this is what it looks like today as a private house. Um, whether the uh, Cressers had time to, to stop, uh, I, I can't imagine because they would have had to have got to the station very, very early um, in the morning to catch the trains or perhaps late in the evenings to get the watercress in London by the next day. But uh, it's a nice idea that perhaps they might have stopped there. And uh, now only five pubs survive in Alsford. But it's a fantastic thing just to walk around this little town to spot where all the old pubs are. Then this photograph that's come up now is um, now approaching the station. You may be able to pick out in the image some carriages on the top of the bridge. It's called Jacklin's Bridge. And uh, it's very unlikely that train carriages would ever have been stationed there uh, when the watercress line was in full um, operation because uh, that, there was only a single track. There, would be, there were sidings there for carriages to be um, parked in, but uh, this is just used by the Heritage uh, Railway uh, volunteers. Right, so um, we've coming full circle now back to the um, the end of the talk, and um, uh, I've called it a wrap because I was trying to be. Well, I don't know why I was trying to be trying to be poetic or something. Uh, and I just wanted to tell you just a little bit more about the Watercrest Way um, right at the start of the talk, which some of you may have missed because we came a little bit later. Um, just to say that. You know, this is a very long trail with incredibly varied terrain and paths. Couldn't resist putting the muddy one in um, as well. It's not all beautiful tracks everywhere. And uh, it is a, a way marked route for walkers, but many sections are now open for cyclists and for horse riders. And the whole remit of the charity is to try to um, pressurise the landowners or encourage the landowners to open up more of their land that they bought very cheaply after the beaching cuts and the closure of the railways in this area to um, give it back to for public access. And um, again, just to remind people that you don't have to do 27 miles all in one go, we've um, identified eight main gateways that you can easily access the watercrest way from either by car most of them are accessible by bus actually as well although not very frequently and there are some lovely circuits that you can do and that's one of the ones that i'm actually leading on saturday we're doing number four i think yes number four we're doing the river rich and water meadows um where we're, we're doing a five to six mile circular walk which includes the watercrest way and uh, takes in some other beautiful places too. And you can just see a yellow uh, splodge on the map, possibly a line. That's the boundary of the Saffron Sasha Park. So anything below that line is part of the park running all the way down to Eastbourne. But the landscape either side of that yellow line is very similar, I'm very lucky in this area. And um, so lastly, about the charity, what do we actually do? Well, we do a lot of things you can see here. There seems to be a lot of cake involved and coffee and, well, there used to be Few trips to the pub as well. Um, a lot of it now is on Zoom, but um, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic organisation to be involved in, not just because of the trustees, but because of the other people that you meet through the networking, through meeting other landowners, from meeting people like Godfrey, who is one of the main archivists for us um, in terms of history um, and in terms of uh, talking to parish councils and even Boomtown, the festival gives us grants for um, some of our, our work. So um, if you want to know anything more about it, do have a look at our website or perhaps if you're into social media, perhaps uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And we've got our own YouTube channel as well. It's a shame we couldn't actually talk, uh, actually use the YouTube channel today, but actually um, our time is getting close to the end anyway. 
So um, thank you very much for your support and um, coming on this little virtual tour today. The actual walk is available, not just on the Ordnance Survey app, but we're, um, we're putting it all on our website. So um, I will try, I'm very brave to go on our website to show you that. Um, if it doesn't work, then um, I will talk you through it as we as I as I do it. Um, if any of you have got any questions, um, please use the the chat box, um, which is uh, on the side or bottom of your screen, and uh, I will endeavour to um, actually uh, answer them. And um, otherwise, do become a friend, which is for free, and follow us on our website or follow us on Facebook. And um, it's uh, it's been it's been great fun actually making this talk because I've actually um, met um, so many other people that I had not met before by doing it. So thank you once again, and thank you very much for the Watercrest Festival for allowing us to be part of their um, their uh, their schedule. So I will try and escape their 